Yahare Ore no Seishun Love Comedy wa Machi Gateru, aka Ore Gairu, the light novel turned anime adaptation, is a good show. The comedy aspects actually exist in it, unlike other rom com anime. The character interactions are pretty fun, and it has cute character designs, which help sell the aesthetic of the show. You may be expecting a butt here, but like a Japanese idol, there is no butt. There's instead an also. There also was this inkling of a complaint that bothered me ever since the first season. By looking at various other anime, I came upon the reason why this unexamined source bot exists in the form of the Naotaku character trope. And I plan to explain exactly that as I outline what a Naotaku character is, how to define it, how it applies to Ordegaidu, and why it matters. I'm not here to tell you not to watch Ordegaidu. Any reasonably smart person would know that you shouldn't. The point of this video is to think critically about the anime that we love and enjoy in both craft and theory. Before I can talk about the Naotaku character though, we have to go back a bit and talk about audience identification. Stories possess the power to emotionally impact an audience. The question is, what kind of relationship do they share? What are you, some loser that would cry over an anime? Don't lie to me, I know you cried during Wolf Children. And because I'm too stupid to answer this question myself, I have some sources. Files on top of files. In his essay on audiences identification with media characters, Jonathan Cohen says, Identification is a mechanism through which audience members experience reception and interpretation of the text from inside, as if the events were happening to them. So the audience can often fill in the shoes of the character, in a way experiencing the events of the story firsthand and identifying with their struggle. This type of connection exists between viewer and character in any story, whether animation, film, literature, or radio. Furthermore, there's research that suggests that movies and TV shows can provide a space for a viewer to understand their problems or vicariously live out a desire missing from their own life. This is all nice nerdy bullshit, but how does this relate to anime? Well, let me show you. Makoto is an absolutely unlikable piece of shit. You are a lucky sub, you! The worst anime character I've seen! I don't know if I'll ever view He ruined this anime! This guy. Everything he does just seems to be there to reiterate how much of a dickhead he is. Like, how That's many bullshit. Times that is bullshit. You see this guy kissing another girl before you realize. Stupid. Fuck! Makoto is the quintessential hated character in the anime community, known almost universally. There's even some hate in the Japanese anime community too. Here, Makoto is a character where the gap between the audience and a fictional story completely collapses. I know it's a huge meme to say this, but you know this is just an anime, right? Like, Makoto can't hurt you in real life. Why are people so mad about him? Makoto is an interesting instance of audience identification because most would argue that they don't identify with him. But he's a perfect example exactly because people got so angry with him. The audience recoils at the thought that the character they initially identify with would make such amoral decisions as cheat on his girlfriend with other girls twice. The audience can easily identify or even self-insert as Makoto in the beginning as a shy boy with an unrequited crush on a beautiful girl that he doesn't know how to approach. We then experience and interpret the story from the inside, but his later actions cause an upheaval in the audience as if to prove their worth and distance themselves of such thinking. These reactions are, well, emotional, but more importantly, moral responses to a character that they used to identify with. One of the reasons why viewers may react so aggressively could be contributed to a psychological phenomenon known as projection. In projection, a person will assign either negative or positive characteristics they possess onto others, or in this case, fictional characters. The linking of identification is the very reason why people reject Makoto. They don't want to associate with the behavior of a character's perspective that they're required to maintain the perspective of, especially when that perspective is decided by a character who only seems concerned with himself. He's a character that acts the opposite of what some would call a chivalrous main character. So identification shows us the connection between audience and character is stocked with emotion and that connection can reflect a mindset that the audience themselves may or may not share. And one factor that strengthens identification is commonalities between character and audience. The term otaku came into widespread understanding in the Western fandom from the release of in America in 1988. The term otaku itself refers to both an individual with intense interests in certain niche subjects like anime, sci-fi, frickin' trains, etc., and the resulting social in-group created similar to a culture club, as outlined in Keichido Morikawa's essay Otaku Geek. 
For this video I'm not going to differentiate between Japanese and American otaku as it doesn't affect my point. Also I'll be referring specifically to anime manga otaku when I say otaku. Now that I think about it, I could have just held up a mirror and skipped the definition entirely. The otaku is a trope that has a distinct interest and representation in media. This trope is beneficial to represent in stories because it allows the anime manga light novel audience an easy character to identify with. Identification relates to the effective impact of the story, so stories that reflect at least some part of its audience are much more likely to receive positive reception. But over time, the depiction of the otaku in anime has shifted from the way they've typically been represented. Now something of a watered down otaku, the character vaguely centers around liking anime, manga, or light novels, but aren't nearly the social outcasts shown in 1979's Japanese newscasts, i.e. shows like Itomanga Sensei, ReZero, Recreators, and will you look at that, Tate no Yusha no Nariagari, or The Rising of the Shield Hero. Naofumi Iwatani is a 20-year-old otaku-leaning college student who spends his allowance playing RPGs and reading light novels. However, Shield Hero is not overtly about this, no. It's a story of a regular guy transported to a new world and his all too sudden fall from grace. Do you see where I'm going with this? After only one day in this new world, Naofumi is framed for raping the eldest princess and is shunned by many in the surrounding community. Thus he holds contempt for his fellow heroes, most women, and the whole system of power that wrongfully accused him and sided with the evildoers. Until we're slowly introduced to his partners, Raftalia, Philo, and Melty. Raftalia is a slave that wants to continue being his slave, Philo is a bird with the imprint of Naofumi as a father figure, and Melty is, uh, you know, uh, how do I put this? 10 years old. Anyways, all these girls are in love with Naofumi, normal stuff, because he's generally a nice guy. A lady. They gather around him as they each earn his confidence and his dependence. Despite all these things though, Naofumi remains cynical, hateful of the king and multi, and only now sees Raftalia as an individual pretty far into the story. He recoils at the thought of women, but will still put himself in harm's way for others. He is at once bitter and hardened, and at others caring and helpful. Paradoxically, Naofumi acts altruistically even with his cynical attitude. One could even say Naofumi is chivalrous, or maybe knightly, or with the way he blushingly rejects these women, you could even say voluntarily celibate. Oh, that's what this video is about. Naofumi is designed this way. He is designed to be empathetic, like the audience, otaku light and altruistic. His approach to society is borderline incel shit. Yet the audience's relationship with Naofumi works opposite to that of Makoto's. People identify with his altruism, similar outlook, and otaku-leaning background. And I'm not the only one to bring up something like this. Have you ever thought to yourself, on the surface, I might be the weird, quiet kid at the back of the class that everyone thinks is socially awkward, but deep down I'm actually really cool and methodical. Remember projection? Instead of projecting away from Makoto, the viewers can project their positive traits onto Naofumi. In this way, his character is built for the cynical and the perfect vehicle to be self-inserted into. This is where the Naotaku character comes in. It's a word I created as a portmanteau of the name Naofumi and the word otaku. The Naotaku is an otaku-leaning socially isolated character that the audience can easily self-insert as because they identify with the worldview and moral behavior that the character exhibits. It often sprouts from a character that acts as an escapist fantasy for the audience often surrounding them with female characters, like in the case with Naofumi. The Naotaku works as an otaku not necessarily on the way of a niche hobbyist, though that is often the case, but is instead a collective social group that they share with the viewer. It attaches itself to the aesthetics of an otaku. The main character may be interested in the culture, may be socially isolated, or seemingly unattractive to the opposite sex. There is a distinction from, say, a Gary slash Mary Sue or an otaku surrogate. A Mary Sue is an author insert that has no flaws nor encounters many character changing events. An otaku surrogate is usually a side character that appeals to the audience as a way to insert references to otaku culture into the story. The Naotaku is unique as they are in some ways the self insert of a more self aware author. It's nestled in the idea of I want to save her. A fedora tipper's wet dream, the incel hero swooping in, 
saving the damsel who falls in love with them despite their shitty, sorry, negative personality, a desire set in the basic male urge to be the hero and save the girl. It's a simple premise, but one that infests the concept of the Nautaku. Audiences seem to empathize with this type of character through their chivalrous nature. Digi in her video on the Asterix War Sucks hits on the ability for the audience to both project themselves into this character as an innocent teenager unaware of the depths of sexuality, but simultaneously indulge in the ultimate what-if scenario if the main character only took the chance, capturing both types of audiences. It really has nothing to do with what makes sense for the characters and everything to do with what works for the audience. The kind of kid who looks for the sort of wish fulfillment that this show provides is probably pretty young and probably a virgin. In spite of their desire to be an all-powerful badass and the object of affection for a bunch of beautiful women, the idea of what they'd actually do in a moment of intimacy is still alien to them. He's meant to be someone for young guys who are both morally upright but also want to be seen as giant badass to project themselves onto a power fantasy where you, the viewer, can save the day and get the girl. There's a common phrase said in the anime community. People will often say something like, if I was Natsu in fairy tale, I would give Lucy the biggest hug of her life. Our very own Demolition D, again, said something similar about SAO. It'll be difficult not to get a little frustrated with Kirito as he retains his modesty and they're alone in a cabin and she's laying on top of you and I just, god damn it, just, just, just put it in or fucking smash that shit. This is all to say this type of, hmm, horniness is not unknown and is a quite common reaction to the self-insert protagonist and a key part of the power fantasy that belies the Naotaku character trope. So let's finally get to what you all have been waiting for. Can we just stay friends for now? There aren't a lot of positive traits that Hikigai Hachiman receives in the beginning episodes of Yahari Ori no Seishun Love Comedy Wa Machi Gateru. God damn, every single time, this is so fucking long. In fact, we see exactly why he's unappealing to the people around him. He has shady looking eyes, he's lanky, selfish, awkward, and extraordinarily pessimistic. Over the first season, we explore the different ways that he pushes others away. And yet here we have two, no, three? Oh wait, no, that's a guy. Two plus characters the writer wants us to know are viable love interests. I thought this was supposed to be relatable, dude. The idea for this video first struck me after watching a compilation of Araha Ishiki clips. Then I realized what Oregairu was playing at. The ultimate hypocrisy of showing Hikigaya, the unlikable weird edgy kid, winning over girls with his altruism while still occupying a kind of identification to establish escapism. Throughout the story, we're supposed to occupy Hikigaya's headspace. While Hikigaya is a toxic character, he's also right, at least in the context of the story. In fact, he's constantly right, and often is the only person to find the best outcome for a situation. The story relishes in his monologues about the reality of life and often justifies them, and to the audience, they are true, because the viewer is supposed to connect with the main character. For example, when Hikigai attacks the culture fair president in an attempt to get her to do her duties out of spite, the viewer understands his intention is good, but his approach is ultimately toxic and self-destructive. But for the time being, he isn't wrong. While seemingly flippant about other people and social etiquette, he's actually acutely aware of these things. In this situation, he acts out of purpose for the greater good, deep down, he is altruistic. And whether we, the audience, are supposed to identify with him or not, doesn't really matter. There are countless posts and videos that exalt Hikigaya's characterization. Comments on those same videos directly identify with his mindset and lifestyle. He is both a selfless hero of the story and a twisted character with deep flaws, and yet he is still indulged with the beautiful icy princess, the cute charming airhead, the boy who looks like a girl, the bratty but innocent underclassman, forming No! No, don't do it! A harem. Hikigai Hachiman is a Naotaku character. This is one reason why the Naotaku is not a Mary Sue. They're not meant to be the perfectly straightforward good guy. They're like you and me, but maybe a bit worse. They're purposely relatable as the otaku light, socially awkward, morally logical hero. It's more incel shit. 
Y'all motherfuckers gonna be real mad I only start talking about Oregaru eight minutes in. But don't worry, I'm not done talking about Oregaru yet. The problem with Hikigai, and more broadly the construction of Oregaru, is that the author wants to eat his cake and then still have it. Hikigai cannot be a lonely, cynical, unattractive incel character, and also a character that attracts women like that one guy everyone forgets the name of in High School DxD. The fuck? This is disguised by the promise that his character will change, but undersold by the fact that this story capitulates with his general attitude. Often in media, we like to see ourselves reflected in the stories that we watch, no matter how faint that may be. The Naotaku character exploits that desire. A character like you, but surrounded by an ensemble of female characters with a power like no one else. This dynamic strips Oregaidu's other characters around Higigaya of depth and agency. They're dependent on him to solve their problems and make any progress to the story. Not only does this type of character weaken the foundations of a compelling plot, but it undermines the integrity, showing that it's no better than a more subtle harem. I understand the desire to watch a character like this, and empathize with them. It can be hard to talk to girls, or guys, whichever, especially when other people can be such a mystery sometimes. <laughs> It's too relatable. It sucks to get your heart broken, or find someone doesn't care about you, or feel lonely. I don't have a quick solution to any of those, because you just can't control other people, but you can control and improve yourself. In these cases, I move on and try to enjoy my life. Anyways, this was your monthly episode of Why Anime is Garbage, and you all suck for watching this type of show and your parents raised you wrong. Be sure to comment your fanfiction about how your non-existent GF loves your shitty personality. On a more serious note, the next time you're watching a show, and the side characters feel stripped of agency, or it might pander to the cynical otaku ideal, you can ask, is this an otaku character? So for me, have a nice day. Peace. See you on the block, you know what I'm serving, yeah. Swag pack, gas pack, I'm serving, yeah. Change work, don't need no jersey. Trying to 